awesome. Hey, gather in, gather in, and if the ushers uh, round up the rest of the herd out there, would be really, really great. Praise the Lord. I just want to uh, say a couple of things before we start. First of all, welcome to everybody, and it's great to have you here. And uh, I always forget to welcome our churches around the world. I mean, they, they tune in, and like Rarotonga, Jonathan, and that are meeting every night as we meet, they meet. And uh, churches throughout New Zealand, I know that a lot of the individual families are all meeting. And um, of course, over there in Myanmar and the Philippines guy, they're always tuning in. And then Barb and Walter up there in San Francisco and Wayne and Oregon. So there's people all around the place. And so we wanna just uh, spread the welcome out. Say, God bless you. We believe you're gonna have a great time. Yeah, give them a hand. Of course, we wanna welcome our uh, brother apostle, uh, Mike Connell. It's fantastic to have Mike here with us. Hallelujah, he's excited that you're excited. I was just reading again, and um, as the guys are coming in, I'll just share a couple of things, but I was just reading again in um, Joshua and uh, chapter six, and it's the story of Jer Jericho, bringing the walls of Jericho down. And I was listening to um, uh, Phil Driscoll a couple of weeks ago, and he brought out the fact about um, you know, when the priests and the army and that marched around Jericho, uh, the Lord gave a command to the people. And uh, I'll see if I've got it here in the Scripture. I wrote some Scriptures down. And um, Joshua chapter 6, verse 10, it said, Now Joshua, and this is, this is um, the Lord gave Joshua the strategy. So He said, you know, you're going to put the army out front. You're going to have the priests. They're going to and then the, they're, they're going to have the ram's horn. Then you're going to have the Ark of the Covenant. And then you're going to have the rear guard and you're gonna march around and they're gonna blow the ram's horn um, for seven days or on the sixth day or whatever, the seventh day. On the command of the Lord, you're gonna give a shout and then God's gonna give us the victory and the walls come down. And it says, Now Joshua had commanded the people saying, You shall not shout or make any noise with your voice, nor shall a mouth until the day I say to you, shout, and then you will shout. And the first time I heard uh, Phil Driscoll mention that, it kind of tweaked something. I thought, oh, I'll go back to the Scripture. When I was looking at it today, it doesn't indicate, it, it's not as if he said that an hour before they went out. He said that from what I understand, it was a week before they went for in the desert. They were known for their moaning and their complaining. And what happens with uh, negativity, negative talk and complaining or moaning, it, it cancels faith. It cancels faith and it cancels our victory. And, um, and one of the things too that I really feel in the church in these days is we, we grant it. And I felt the Lord had spoken to me a few weeks ago and He said, we need to be more deliberate um, in our invitation to the Lord to come into the midst of our meeting. We need to be more specific about it. But anyway, I was thinking about the, um, I was thinking about how the order, so the army went out in front and then the priests went out with the ram horn and, they, and then the Ark of the Covenant, which represents the presence of God. And wherever you see in the, in the uh, Old Testament, you often see the priests bring in the ark, which they bring in the presence of God. Uh, what we know in 1 Peter chapter 2, it says this, but you're a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, His own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of Him who called you out of the darkness into His marvellous light. There's one, there's a verse in here I'm gonna preach on at some time, but not tonight. I'm gonna let Mike preach tonight. But um, it, it says, it goes on, it says, um, into his mouth, like, who were, who were not a people, but are now a people of God. Isn't that interesting? They, before Christ, it says you were not a people before Christ, but after Christ, you're now you are actually the people of God who have not obtained mercy, but now. Okay, the thing about it is this. So we know now that we are the priests. We're the priests. And so we carry now the Ark of the Covenant. The presence of God comes with us. So the presence comes with us. So now in the, in the message, the Lord's been saying to me that we need to be more deliberate about this. We need, we need to be conscious of the fact that we have come filled with the presence of God, that we bring Him, we bring His presence into the house. And uh, I, I really believe that, um, uh, that we need to be really positive. We need to be faith-filled. We need to be expectant. We need to invite the Lord specifically. We need to, over these meetings, over these meetings, just watch your conversation. Um, don't negate, don't cancel 
the miracle power of God with negativity. You know, because the danger is, you know, somebody cuts you off on the way in and you start whining and moaning and something else happens and everything's going wrong and, and you just get into a negative mode without realising it and you begin to cancel every faith-filled, positive, God-glorifying thing around your life. And so I just really want to encourage you just to, to be faith-filled. So we're going we're gonna to stand together and we're going to pray. And I want each one of you, <coughs> recognising you're a priest of God, Father, we just, we just individually, every one of us in this place, we invite You to come in the midst of us now. We know that You're already with us, You're in us, You're around us, You're on us, Holy Spirit. And we love You, Holy Spirit. We love Your presence. And as an individual and corporately, we just say, come Holy Spirit. Oh, come Holy, just lift up your hands. Come Holy Spirit. Oh, Holy Spirit. We just ask that you just move and touch and encourage, open up our hearts to receive from you. We thank you for your messenger tonight. We thank you for the message and anticipation, Lord, tonight. We thank you for your presence. We ask, Holy Spirit, you would take your words through our brother and apply them into our hearts and change our lives. Holy Spirit, I just ask that you would baptise us over these days afresh and anew. We ask, Holy Spirit, You would just draw near to us again and that You would baptise us afresh and anew. So we welcome You. We roll out the red carpet. We want the whole entourage of heaven in here. We want all the elders from around the throne. We want the living creatures. We want the seraphim and the cherubim and the angels of God. We want You to fill this place up, Lord, with Your glory and Your glorious presence, Lord. And we pray these things in the mighty Name of our wonderful Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Give the Lord a hand and a blessing. Hallelujah. Let's come together, church. Yeah. We give you praise. We give you praise. Yes. We give you praise. We give you praise.
every voice. I raise a hallelujah. My weapon is a melody. I raise a hallelujah. Heaven comes to fight for me.
yes, Lord, we are yours tonight. We are your body, your vessel. Everything we have is yours. We love to worship you, Lord. We love to worship you, Lord. We are your vessels. We are your chosen. A place of dwelling for our Lord. Place of dwelling for our Lord. We will surrender. We will be made new. We will give you every room. Every corner of our hearts. Every
your body, your church will come in alive. One passion, one heart, one mind. Your body, your church will come in alive. One passion, one passion, one heart, one mind. Your body, your church. Oh, no. 
awesome. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Thank you, Holy Spirit. We give you liberty in this place. We give you freedom in this place, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit, have your way. Have your way in our hearts. Have your way in our lives. Have your way in our cities, in our churches, in our families. Welcome. We welcome you. We welcome your presence. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, Lord, we just bless your awesome, awesome name. Amen. Amen. Hey, you may be seated. God bless you, church. That's great. Hey, we're going to, uh, it's a great part of the service, actually. We're going to take up a love offering for our brother, Mike. Yeah. Hallelujah. And, um, you know, you notice with, uh, with the gatherings, we haven't got a charge on the gatherings. We've just um, wanted to sow into your lives, silly. And we just encourage you to freely give. And, uh, but I want you to understand something. It's really, when you sow into the ministry, it almost opens something up in the spirit realm to receive from the ministry. There's a connection. It's almost like when you sow in, you receive. There's, there's something that just happens in the spirit. So I'm not going to prolong this, but I just want us to sow into his ministry, um, not just investing in his presence, but investing in the future and what God has for him. So, Father, we thank you for this wonderful opportunity of being able to give and to sow and to share, Lord, the resources that you've given us with our brother. We thank you so much, Lord, that he's come to share your heart, your word, uh, your revelation in his life with us. And, Lord, we know it's invaluable. We thank you and we appreciate that, Lord, so much. And bless, Lord, as we give in your mighty, mighty name. Amen, amen, and amen. Hey, thank you, ushers. That's really great. Just a couple of announcements. Of course, uh, tomorrow morning we have a a meeting at 10 o'clock in the morning. We'll be meeting at 10. And then, of course, we'll be meeting on Saturday night at 6.30. And then uh, Sunday morning, 10 o'clock, of course, we'll be gathering in and and, uh, winding things up. It's amazing because when you start the week, it seems like everything's going slow. And then after a couple of days, everything's just going so fast. You know, it's like it's all whizzing by. And... uh, I just, I just still believe that God wants to do a great work in us over, this, over these days. And uh, just continue to open up your heart. Just say, you know, even in your own prayer, your own, just say, come Holy Spirit, just do what you need to do in me to make me more like Jesus, you know. And uh, the Lord will respond to those sorts. He loves those sorts of prayers. Hey, just a little bit of an update too on our truck. Um, I have, I never, I got too busy. I haven't even rung the guy. It's probably ready to be picked up this week, but I never got around to organising anything. But um um, doing really, really good. And we haven't really pushed hard on raising money in that for the truck, although we would like to raise the money for the truck. I think uh, Mel sent me a report. We've got over $20,000 has already come in in gifts and sewing towards the truck. And uh, just bring it to your mind and, uh, you know, just let the Holy Spirit talk to you about sewing into that ministry. But we're really looking forward to the truck coming down, kitting it up with all of the sound system, getting it ready and uh, you know, we just feel the Lord is going to send us out into the highways and the byways and to preach the word. Um, you know, we're not going out with a political message. We're not trying to change the government, uh, the natural government anyway. We're trying to change the government totally. We want the government of God. We want the kingdom of God ruling and reigning in our nation. But we want to get the good news out there in our community and tell them that there's a better way, that our God is alive, that He's real, that He's powerful. And so we're going to be doing that. And uh, it's just going to be really, really uh, exciting, I believe, the next stage of us uh, pushing out into those things. But um, hey, let's give uh, our brother a very, very warm welcome. We honour him. We want to receive from him. We bless you, brother. Thank you so much for being with us. Awesome. It's an honour to be here. Great. What a great church. Come on, let's give Jesus a clap. He is so good. Lord, you're so good. We honour you and love you. Lord, we need you to come and touch us and help us. Amen. What a great crowd out again tonight. Awesome. Just, I love the, love the worship. All the young people just, wow, that was great. It was great. Come on, give them a clap. I appreciate them. That doesn't just happen, you know. It takes a bit of time and effort to make all that happen. And uh, just a great joy to be here and, to, uh, and just to share out of the overflow what, I, what God has shown me over years and, uh, in ministry. You know, I was just tossed into it. And, uh, you know, in, in our day, you never went to schools and trained or anything like that. They tossed you in. If you survived, you must have had a call of God on your life, you know. It was kind of it. 
you know. <laughs> and uh, nowadays, you've got to have all kinds of things, and still people struggle with it all. But uh, we were ju- I just was asked to set up a Christian school, set up the Christian school, and uh, so I gave up my career. Uh, I had a clear word from God to do this and gave up the career I had and got involved in the Christian school. And uh, then within about six months, I was pastoring a church. And as well as doing the school and, and had a family about four at that stage, so life was frantic. And uh, it's been in the journey of doing all of this, the only way I could get through was to find God in it and then to hear him and let him speak to me. And then in the journey we've taken, uh, we've had to face many things, many, many difficult things and pressures. And, and God helped us to go through and find his solutions in the circumstances we found ourselves in. And uh, they were very difficult, some of them. You know, we had adopted a daughter out before we were married, and that left a trauma in our lives. You know, later on, we had a a daughter that was uh, sexually assaulted seriously while we were doing the building for the church, and that creates crisis in our life. And we had many. I've just had so many of them. It's like we're just one after the other. But what we found is if you respond to God with a right heart, then you come out the other side seeing his power and his glory and, and seeing life and relationships change. And so we've been able to share out of these things. And uh, so I want to share a message tonight called The First Commandment with a Blessing. The First Commandment with a Blessing. And one of the reasons I want to share it is because I go all over the world and minister to hearts, healing of the heart, as well as setting people free and ministering and building people's faith. And I've discovered the principle I'll share with you tonight comes up all the time. I have people come from in for, for help, you know, from all over the world, really, and some of them are people in politics, some of them are people in, in ministry, some of them in the pop fields. There's all kinds of people, but there's sort of commonality around it all, that there are certain principles that if they're violated have consequences that go on through your life, and this is one of them. And so now I've learned that when I'm helping people, I look for certain things. And in the looking for them, I suddenly discover actually that's where the problem started. And for many people, they come to me and they have an issue that is destroying their life or overwhelming their life. And they can't connect what they're, what they're experiencing now with a violation of God's principles that took place much earlier. And that's because the spirit realm doesn't work like a light switch. It works on the principle of sowing and reaping. So you sow, then there's a period of time, and then you reap. And the deceitfulness of sinners, we don't see an immediate consequence of violation of the law. We start to reap it later on and can't work out why. And then we usually try to solve it in ways that don't solve it at all. Now, if you try to get professional help often they'll put a label on it and then try to help you manage it but we have access to the kingdom of God to deal with the root systems that cause the behaviors and uh, so I want to share on that tonight I want to start off in in Malachi I like to start on Malachi Malachi chapter 4 and verse 5 and 6 and God is speaking to his people and says behold I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming and great and dreadful day of the Lord and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to the children hearts of the children to the fathers lest I come and smite the earth with a curse I can share a lot about that, but I'm just going to give you just, I just want to give you just a bit of a context for where we're going to go here. Notice this this is the closing words in the Old Testament, and he refers to to Elijah. And uh, the moment he refers to Elijah, you're taken back then to a period in the nation's history when it had broken down. There was a queen called Jezebel. There'd been a political alliance between Ahab and Jezebel. And then she introduced, she sabotaged the worship of the nation. She changed the culture of the nation. She introduced foreign gods, Baal and Ashtoreth. And so she brought the whole nation into spiritual bondage. And the consequence of that Uh, as the introduction of idolatry and with it immorality, drugs, the whole deal. The things we see happening all over the world. As she introduced this into the nation, there was a decline in the heart and character of the nation, spiritually, morally, financially, but also in the homes. And the impact of the idolatry and the sexual immorality, the replacement of God as being the foundation of the nation and the family life, was that hearts of fathers became hardened. 
And this resulted in breakdown in families where the children reacted with hardness against their fathers. And so you not only had moral and spiritual corruption, you had breakdown in families as well. And family is very dear to the heart of God. God is a father. And so he, he wants to raise up a family. So when a nation loses these foundations, it's inviting then destruction. When a church loses its family foundation, it's also inviting the intervention of God to do something about it. And so we see this happening across the body of Christ where corporate culture has replaced family culture, then God has to intervene at some point and do something about it because it fails to represent his heart. Elijah was raised up and his primary role was not to be against something as much to be for something. When you're for something, you will be against something because they'll oppose you. And so what he was for was for the restoration of the altar of the Lord, his significant event altar of the Lord that was broken down to call the nation back into relationship with God and the restoration of godly foundations in the families. That's the core of it. And you notice there that the key of his ministry was that in bringing people back to God and away from idols and immorality, there would be a turning of hearts, firstly of fathers. The nation breaks down when the family breaks down. The family breaks down when fathers no longer fulfill their role in headship and leadership in the family. This is why we have so much problem. You can't put any social program in that will fix that. You have to go to the core of it. That's why God never tries to dress up stuff. He always goes to the core of the problem, which is the role of fathers and the leadership in the home. Oh, it's getting quiet now. I won't go too far down that way. I want to look at one specific aspect. So the ministry of Elijah, although it involves confronting Jezebel, actually it's confronting the spirit that brings idolatry and control and emasculates men and stops the families being what they're supposed to be. In other words, its foundation is repentance. So he's referring here not only to Elijah, but the Elijah to come would be John the Baptist preaching the kingdom of God, the order of God, the governance and structure of God throughout society, as well as a heart shift through repentance to embrace God's order. And I have no doubt that this is not just about John the Baptist. I'm sure that this refers to the end times when there'll be a global breakdown of family life and the need for a move of God to restore repentance into the nation. I'm very strong on repentance, no deliverance without repentance. So you'll find an interesting thing in the life of Israel, I don't want to get sidetracked, but in, in the season or the story of the book of Judges, God, we find in the book of Judges, we find every time they got absorbed into the culture and took on the culture, they ended up serving the gods of the culture. When they served the gods of the culture, they came under the governance of the people of those gods. And then they lived in slavery, suffering, until they cried, and God showed them what they needed to do. It was always repentance. The judges always led people to repentance, then to deliverance. It's a pattern right through there to teach us so many, many, many things. So, that, so here it is. You notice there, he's raised up by the Lord to deal with the core root issue. And what I have discovered is that in almost all the work I do in dealing with people, we have to go right back into the foundations of the family. And it's the generational legacy that people have received and what they have experienced growing up and how they've responded. And that's what I'm going to move, that's what I want to use to form the basis of just moving forward. Let me give you just a couple of stories. I had one young man, and he came up in a word of knowledge in Singapore, and uh, he uh, had I heard a word of knowledge, he got, someone had massive pain and couldn't move his arm. And this young man came up, and as he came up, the Lord spoke to me that he has bitterness against his father. And uh, I said to him, I said, uh, how do you get on with your father? And he said, no, I love my father. I'm thinking, oh, heck, you know, what do I do? Jesus, you better give me a bit more now. And uh, <clears throat> this is what the Lord told me. He said, 
that his father is a businessman who travels and he's been away for much of his life and he's very embittered that he wasn't there for him. And I asked him, is this true? And he said, it is. And I said, because of your bitterness against your father, you've opened the door for a spirit of infirmity. What you have is a demonic spirit in your life because of a bitterness in your heart. Will you repent and forgive your father? And he did right there in front of everyone. I commanded the spirit of bitterness to leave and immediately he was healed. Now, then he said this to me. He said, well, pastor, I didn't just have a pain in my shoulder. I had pain right through my whole body. And I was told by the doctor, my back, my spine was stiffening. And within, by the time I was 40, I wouldn't be able to bend over. And he said, I am totally free. Isn't that amazing, eh? That is so amazing. I had another, and I, got, I, got, I mean, stories abound because this is just everywhere. I had a, another young woman, and I was in a church, and they asked me to counsel this person. I thought, it's a bit unusual. Anyway, I've got the appointment. I'll do it. And uh, usually I work with the pastors and leaders, and this time it was a, a woman, a young woman. And she's, I said, what's the issue? What do you want to talk about? She said, oh, pastor, I just need your advice on whether I should marry this man. I'm thinking, oh, my goodness. <clears throat> okay, I'm here, so let's... Listen to the story and see what's going to happen. I said, well, tell me about the guy. Firstly, is he a Christian? No, he isn't. I said, well, the short answer to all of this is no. But since we're here, tell me a bit more and about your story. And so she told me she'd hooked up with this guy quite some time before and then got pregnant to the guy and then got a, a, had a baby to him and then uh, broke up the relationship and then... Uh, got connected to some other guy and broke that off. And now this other guy's coming asking if, he'll marry, if she'll marry him. And I said, well, I said, well. I said, well, first of all, you're not a Christian, so he hasn't changed. So what he was like before, he's still the same. I said, but I am curious about this. I said, tell me about your own father. And she said, I don't get on with him. I said, why is that? She said, well, he, he and mum split up when I was about 13. I said, why have they split up? She said, oh, well, he was unfaithful to mum. I said, well, that's a good reason to split up. I said, why did you split up with this young man? Oh, he was unfaithful to me. I said, how many times? Said, oh, three times. I said, well, that was a good move to split up, and he hasn't changed, so don't have him back. I said, tell me about your dad. Well, he was unfaithful. How many different women? He said, three women. I said, I don't know whether you can see the connection, but to me it's glaringly obvious. You have an issue with your father, and you are reproducing the exact situation in your life. You're about to enter into a marriage relationship with someone who morally and spiritually is exactly like your father. It's like the thing you never resolved with your father, you're about to repeat in your life, so you will resolve it, and it's going to cause you great sorrow. Do not marry this man. And she couldn't see it. She was totally blind. And I said, I can't help you. I can't help you. I've told you what I see, that you have unresolved bitterness and you're about to make a terrible fa a mistake. And she couldn't see it. I said, it's because your heart is set on this and it will end in disaster for you. So I just left it go. Nothing I could do. You understand that God does not violate our will. He lets us reap the consequences of the decisions we've made in our life. Okay, so I want to go on then and now open up this whole thing for you and just show you something related to it, okay? And so um, God is concerned about this. So if we read in Ephesians 6, 1 through to 4, 1 through to 4. Again, there's a lot of stuff in it, but I want to just focus on one aspect of this. Children, obey your parents in the Lord. <laughs> Which is, Obey your parents in the Lord. That's a great scripture. And then, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And that means righteous. Well, this is how, when you're a young person, you keep God's law, you have a proper relationship with your parents. That word obey means to listen, to listen attentively and respond to them. For this is righteous. This is how a child walks right before God. And then he goes on and says this. He says, honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. So listening and responding to your parents, then is the one of the significant ways you honor them. So the two are connected together. But I want to focus on that word honor. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you that you may live long on the earth. 
And then he talks to fathers. He says, fathers, don't provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. Now, you notice there, like in Ephesians 6, 1, in the Passion Translations, said, children, if you want to be wise, listen to your parents and do what they tell you, and the Lord will help you. That's quite a nice description of it, isn't it? But here's the principle in here, honor. Placing weight upon your parents, your father and your mother, and that means opening your heart to listen to them and respond to them. Solomon, the wisest man in the earth, he begins by saying, son, listen to your parents, just like I listened to my father. Okay, now I want to walk through this. You notice that there's a promise made. So it doesn't just tell you to do something. It tells you to do something because we tend not to do it. It tells us there's a great promise with this. And the person who made the promise is God himself. In other words, God makes a promise attached to our way that we walk and relate to our parents. That life may be well for you and you may live long. So the converse is also true. That if we violate the law, life will not go well for you in many different ways and your life may prematurely end, or there may be some sickness that results in early death. So this is a very important foundational principle, very important. Now, Jesus himself lived according to this. So you find him at the age of 12 in the temple, and he's called of God. He must be in the place of training now to learn the trade. And when the parents have now come looking for him, they said, look, you cause us a lot of stress and anxiety, and and, and, and what's going on here? He said, don't you know I must be about my father's business? But they didn't know, and they said, no, you come with us. Now you see the conflict he's in. Knowing the call on his life and that he's in the place he should be for his training, And his parents don't understand that call, and they tell him to do something that's different. No, you come with us, and you stay with us in a small town, and you learn your father's trade, and you take over the family business, and you raise and lead the family when your father passes away. So in other words, instead of being in the temple learning what he's called to be and to do and learning the words of God from the scribes and Pharisees or whatever of the day, he's now going to live in a small town and do an apprenticeship to his father and he's going to have a different course to his life. Now you understand that's a very big thing. And it, it says these dramatic words in Luke chapter 2. He was subject to them and returned with them. And then the promise, and the child grew in wisdom, stature, and favor with God and man. You notice now, he has honored his parents. At the age of 12, he has a choice to honor them by listening and responding or dishonor them. He chooses to honor them, and God saw that a promise is fulfilled. He grew in wisdom. That wisdom come from God. That's a divine flow of God to his heart and life through his relationship with the Father. And he grew in favor with God. Favor means access. Favor means people look on you and they want to do something to help you go forward and get ahead. Favor is important in life. Of all the things you want, you want favor because favor opens doors for you. And he didn't just grow in favor with God, he also grew in favor with men. In other words, people liked him and wanted to give him a door of opportunity and a help. And that's this principle here, right there. Well, I guess everyone knows that scripture, but this is I'm trying to open up something more to you. So what I have found in working with people is that frequently when life is not going well for them, there has been a violation of the law related to honoring their parents. So I go and look back there. Let's have a little look. How did you get on? How was it? And that's where we start to find the issues. I find the issues are frequently generational. It's not just something that's come up in their life. This is their part of a family where there's been struggles going on for generations and no one has ever stood up to face it and overcome it. And, and many times I find people come and they're very hurt because of what happened in their family. There's been abuse, there's been brokenness, there's been alcoholism, been violence, all kinds of stuff. And so they're very wounded in their heart and they're adopting a victim posture. And I try to tell them, and based on Isaiah 61, in all your family, no one has been able to overcome the cycle of destruction 
God has given you the honor of being the one chosen to stand up and bring it all to an end and to build something different for the next generation. You understand? You need to break out of a victim mindset and into a mindset of honor, that actually God has put an honor on me. He chose me. He saved me, and now he wants me to bring an end to the cycle, first in my own heart, and then by building something different to the next generation. Now, that's incredibly powerful. You are called to be a legacy builder. In other words, God's blessing is not just for you. It's to change you so you will bring a blessing to the next generation, both immediate and then also on a larger scale. How about that? <laughs> okay, so we've got to deal with it. So, so notice said he talks about honor. So he says, it'll, here's the promise that it may go with you. You'll thrive in your relationships and you'll thrive in life. You'll experience favor. And then the second one is, of course, that you may live long. That's longevity and health and a certain measure of protection. So these, are, are pro, these promises are conditional on what we do. So Christ himself has met all the conditions of this. My role is to believe that in Christ all the conditions are met for me to walk in blessing, but if I really believe it, I will align with it. You understand there's a difference between the Old Testament where I have to, if I do this, then that will happen. So he's citing an Old Testament promise, you see. So if you do this, then this. Do this, then this. Don't do this, then another problem. But in Christ, we come through a different filter of the new covenant where Jesus himself did it all for us for blessing. But if I really believe he has done that, then I need to align myself with him and his word and blessing automatically flows. It flows because I'm aligned with Christ to be like him in conduct and attitude and behavior. And as in my alignment with him and faith in him and his work, that's what brings it to my life. I don't have to worry whether I'm not doing it perfectly. He's done it on my behalf. So what does it mean to honor? To honor means to fix a value on someone. It's a decision you make to place value on someone, to place a weight on them, to, to treat them as someone of value. And this is a big problem because in our, we live in a culture of dishonor where people complain and criticize. Someone succeeds, they criticize and pull them down, the tall poppy syndrome. To, to honor means to look at the uh, achievements or the work or the character of someone and to have respect for them for who they are. And so the Bible tells us we're to honor all men. But honor is a kingdom principle. So honor is foundational in the kingdom of God. Honor will open up people to respond to you. That's how it works. So in your heart, if you make a decision, that one can't get me ahead, you will automatically dishonor them, and whatever they have can never be released into your life. And so many do that. They, they use the world's thinking, how can you get me ahead, rather than actually God has given me the greatest honor of bringing me into his family, of making me a child of a king, so therefore I honor other people and see them, even if they're broken, as people of value, enormous value. It's being able to look past the brokenness and see within it there's a person of great and immense value. That's, that's what this looks like. And to treat them that way. <laughs> we're all getting quiet, so I know we're... But it's a kingdom principle. So, you know, I, I remember in, in the church that I was in, the pastor I was under was pretty rough in his style and whatever. And if you wanted to, you could be offended easily. I chose not to be offended. I chose to see the gift on his life and what would come into me if I honored and respected the God part of him. You just have to give grace for the other stuff. Because, And here's the thing, God just uses people. People have got a right heart to him or use them. And often there's some funny stuff that you, if you want to get offended, you can get offended very easily. That's how it was. And out of the group that was with him, I was the one who carried what he had. I've done that more than once. I've learned the principle. Had to apply it to my own life and relationship to my own father, and then to apply it to ministries, connecting to them and honoring them. And then to apply it on a bigger, bigger, bigger stage where actually we treat all men with honor. Even if they behave badly, we don't make honor conditional on their behavior because that's never how we got it. We make honor the gift to them to place value on them. Okay, well, there's a whole thing of its own. So dishonor means you treat someone got no value. 
you despise them and look down on them because you made a judgment in your heart about them. So you, you treat them like, the word means to treat like vapor, no substance, nothing. Right? So dishonor blinds us to the giftings and contribution in their life. You can't see what God has put in their life. That could be a blessing if it was unlocked. And sometimes just honoring people is the way you unlock what's got in, what they've got in their life. It's amazing, isn't it? And uh, I've I got so many examples. Let me give you one more example. I had, this one's a classic one. I had a, a girl, we shared our story about having uh, ha- our brokenness before marriage and adopting a daughter out and how God had returned her to us. And, uh, and a, a girl came up and got saved that day, and she'd been adopted at the age of five. And uh, anyway, the next time we were there, um, she came up and shared her testimony in the church. And when she shared her testimony, the Lord said, I want to heal her broken heart. I want you to pray for her. So she shared her testimony, the introduction and that kind of stuff. And, and then I came up and said, would that girl like to come up, please? I'd like to just uh, talk with you. And she came up and stood there in the front. And uh, I, I said to her, tell me a little bit about yourself. And, and she did. And I said, look, I really enjoyed your testimony so much. And what I want to do is this. I want to pray for you. And, uh, and anyway, this is what happened. I said, this is what I want you to do. I said, can you remember the day that you were adopted? She said, I was five. My father had already abandoned the family. My mother couldn't cope with me. And without me knowing, she told the authorities, and they turned up one day at the door and took me away, screaming and crying. It's a horrendous story and traumatic. I said, can you remember it? I said, if you can, if you can just let the Lord come into that memory, he can heal it. Anyway, I, uh, I, had a, uh, I just said, just, just close your eyes, and I, this is what I want you to do. I want you to just open your heart to let Jesus come and heal you. And she said, oh, I remember it. I can see it now. And she began to weep. And I said, I want you now. Jesus is going to come into that, that day, that time, that moment, and bring healing if you'll let him. And I said, look around that scene, which is so horrific to you, and see if you can see him. She said, oh, I see him. I said, what is he like? She said, he's very sad at what's happening to me. I said, I want you to reach out to him. He wants to help you. And I didn't think she would reach out physically, but she reached out like that with her hand. And then she froze and was like that for 45 minutes. Now, it's just impossible to do it. She was just frozen, weeping as Jesus encountered her and touched her. I just carried on the meeting. We preached the gospel. We had an altar call for salvation. I said, please just surround her. Don't let anyone bump her in her encounter. And then just as I had the altar call, suddenly she came come out of it. She's back again. I saw her the next day. I didn't recognize her. She was so transformed. Anyway, a time goes by. We were back there at the church again, and it just gets better and better. And she, she was there at the door to meet meet us as we came in. She said, Pastor, Pastor, Pastor. She said, the best thing has possibly happened. I said, what's happening? She said, well, in Taiwan, they won't let you go back. The government closes the adoption records. They won't let you go back. But we prayed in my group and we went down there and there was a Christian in the office and she told me who my mother was and where she lived. And we, I went to see her and she's in the meeting today. Oh my goodness, I couldn't, just astonishing. Astonishing. Anyway, it was just an amazing day and and they were so touched. But here's where I want to get to with it. I talked with her about a story to find out a little more. And she had been adopted when she was at the age of five. And then she, of course, held bitterness in her heart towards her mother and judged her mother. And at the age of 18, she got pregnant and had an abortion. No, she adopted the child out. I thought, that is amazing. The very thing you judge your mother for, you've done the same thing. And then she got a second pregnancy, and, and, uh, and with the second pregnancy, she aborted the baby. I thought, you've not only done what your mother did, you've done worse than your mother. And she, she, had, she hadn't realized the connection between the deep bitterness she'd held in her heart and dishonor of her mother, and then how her life then went so badly. And so she had another round of ministry and God was able to touch her and heal her because she had to deal with a heart issue of dishonor of her mother and her father because of the experience she had. 
in the idea. So when we violate the principles of God, there's always a consequence. So I went through the Bible and I had a look. I said, I wonder what it's got to say if Jesus said it, and then Jesus taught it as well in Matthew 15. He, he actually reinforced the scripture. So I thought if he modeled it and he lived it and he taught it, it's got to be important. I look and see when it says, this is the first commandment with a promise. What happens if you dishonor your parents? And, and so the Bible's got a number of things. Like for example, it says in Deuteronomy 27, 16, cursed is the one who treats his mother and father or father with contempt. And everyone will say amen. In other words, well, this is the whole list of curses listed in Deuteronomy 28. And he's saying, if you have contempt for your parents, then these curses will come upon you. And those curses, if you will go through them, they talk about physical health, about uh, premature death, about oppression. They talk about family failure, about your children being brought into captivity and never able to enjoy them, about marriage breakdown. In fact, a whole range of curses in Deuteronomy 28. And, and one of the causes of them coming upon people is that they dishonor their parents. Whoa. So, th so there are many consequences. And you can read them in Deuteronomy 28. Jesus came to redeem us from the curse of the law. So he came to set us free. But violation of the law of God does bring these things into our life. So we look around and we see so many of the problems in society. If you will track them, you can track them straight back to the family and straight back to what happened, the failure of a father or a mother to lead their family the way God wants it led and the reaction of the children to dishonor them and the subsequent catastrophe that comes. Uh, here's another thing. So first of all, cursing instead of blessing. The second thing that happens is legal rights are given for demons to afflict you. So people don't get this. They don't get it at all. In Leviticus 20 and verse 9, everyone who curses his father, that means speaks bad about his father or his mother, shall be put to death. Now that's a pretty serious, that's a capital punishment to curse your parents. Now, of course, in the Bible, they didn't really carry it out. God is revealing, though, in his heart, it's a serious matter to speak against your parents, to curse them, and to speak evil of them. Now, here's the thing. That is the law. Now, even though the law isn't carried out physically, in the spirit, spirits of death are able to come against you because you violate the law. See, the thing is, if you travel down the road, so 50k area, and you travel at 100k, and then the cop stops you and you say, I didn't know, it doesn't matter. You still get the fine. In other words, violating the law creates in the spirit realm room for demons, a legal right to afflict you. This is why when people dishonor their parents and it becomes an issue in their heart, there is a cycle in their life of demonic oppression, cycles of it. just keeps happening until it's stopped, until you actually come to a place of repentance. So violations of the law create legal rights for demons to afflict people. Uh, and notice here it says the death penalty. Well, I have found many people with the spirit of death. Gets how a spirit of death manifests in people's lives. Emotional numbness. They can't feel because so much pain, and they've come into agreement with the spirit of death, and it's just shut them down. Now they can't enter into joyful intimacy. It also creates a deep loneliness and isolation where even if they're in relationship, they can't feel the connection. Oh, got quiet then, didn't it? Okay, here's another thing that happens, spiritual blindness and relational blindness and insensitivity. So in Proverbs 20, verse 20, whoever curses father or mother, his lamp will be put in deep darkness, so the lamp in darkness is, is a picture there of lack of revelation or understanding. And what it really means, you have an inability to see why you're having problems in your marriage and family. You can't see the real cause. You react to the behaviors, but don't see there's something deeper at work creating this problem right through like a river through the family. Okay, here's another one then, and, uh, and uh, the last one there is demonic oppression. And uh, in Proverbs 30, verse 17, the eye that mocks his father and scorns obedience to his mother, the ravens of the valley will pick it out, the young eagles will eat it. The ravens are unclean birds, so they're a picture of demonic spirits, and they then are able to oppress people. So people then live in rebellion and in darkness, and they feel they're justified because they're looking certainly at the fault and failure of a father or a mother. But then realize, actually, I'm in darkness. I'm in darkness. I'm in darkness not because of what they did, but because of what I chose to respond with. Instead of responding with the grace of God, I have responded with judgment and anger and hurt and bitterness. 
So that brings us then to this looking then at the root of bitterness, because this is the problem. This was a serious problem. When Israel came out of Egypt, the very first issue that God addressed in their life in Exodus 15 is the issue of bitterness in the heart. They had lived in slavery, they lived oppressed, they lived abused, they had lived in the most appalling circumstances as an oppressed and uh, and beaten people. They were victimized brutally for 400 years, and they adopted then a mindset of a victim. The mindset of a victim or the identity of a victim is, this is who I am. I'm a victim, and victims look for someone to blame and someone to get them out. And so what happened is, they have come out of Egypt, so they're no longer oppressed, but their ident- their thinking hasn't changed. There's still bitterness in the heart. So they still look for someone to blame every time something goes wrong, and they're still looking for someone to get them out of the mess. And you can't enter into God's promises with a victim identity and a victim mindset. And if you look in the world today, media and the, the trend that's taking place politically is to turn people into victims. Instead of you are a person made in the image of God and you have the ability and power in God's hands to arise, they put them all as a group. You're a victim group. You're a victim group because of your color, because of the shape of your head, because of whatever, or what, how you do sex. Or what. It's like it's just labeling people, putting them into a group and saying, you are oppressed. You need a rescuer, meaning you need the government to take over and then to try and buy the balances. It'll never work. No one's ever free that way. They get more oppressed. So so you see that this is a very fundamental thing that is is found very simply in the Bible. God brought them to the waters of Marah. He gave them a little bit of hardship to flush up that they were bitter in their heart. Marah means bitter, bitter waters. But God showed Moses a tree. He cried out to God. So the people acted like victims. Moses cried out to God, and God showed him a tree that when you put the tree into the bitter waters, they turned sweet saying that even if you've gone through pain and hardship and victimization, if you will discover the power of the cross and what Jesus has done on your behalf, then if you will let it enter your life, if you'll apply it to your life, bitter waters can turn sweet. Come on, that's great news, isn't it? That's awesome news, what Jesus did for us. So there we go. So it's the first issue. And it it grows. Bitterness, it says, is a root. It grows in the heart. You don't see it, but you can always tell it's fruit. I can tell the fruit of bitterness in people very easily. One, it shows on their face, sour. (laughs) Another, as I've noticed with bitter people, they're always ungrateful. They never thank you for anything. That tells me they're bitter. There's bitter, and bitter bitter people, they feel entitled. Because I've gone through something, somebody owes me, so they carry on this entitlement to help or whatever, and there's no gratitude ever shown. Lots of, lots, I'm not going to go into it all tonight, but, but it develops as a root. It develops when people are hurt and don't resolve it. They're hurt, and then they become angry. <laughs> now, wh- when you get hurt and become angry, you can choose to lean into God and resolve it with grace, or you can choose to try and control it and bury it, and then it becomes bitterness eventually. So in Hebrews 12, 15, it says, uh, take heed, brethren. In other words, better be careful about this one. This is a big one. Take heed lest you fall from the grace of God. Now, he's saying God wants you to flow in a river of grace that you not only receive it, but you extend it as well. And he says, watch out you don't fall out of it. And and a root of bitterness comes up inside your life and many become poisoned and defiled by it. So a root of bitterness grows in the heart and you can't see it, but it comes out the mouth and in the attitudes and relationships, it poisons families. That's why it becomes a generational thing. So he said, watch out, take care, take heed to it. So it starts very simply. People get hurt, they get injustice, they feel angry, and they don't resolve it. They don't resolve it the same day. They simmer and let it grow in their heart. It becomes offense. When you're offended, you wall your heart up, and now it's just festering around inside. It's, after a while, it becomes resentment. You feel hostile that you're treated this way. And then it becomes a root of bitterness, and that starts to defile everything. Then people seek revenge. They seek to retaliate and pay back some way, to get even. That's what happens. And so you can't solve cultural issues that involve bitterness and injustice and hatred by trying to even it up somehow. 
You've actually got to deal with the heart issue and the only one that can do it is Jesus Christ. He brings it into the core of the issue, which is in the heart. Yes, we can do some things to try and sort injustice out, but the real issue is the one in the heart. Must be dealt with in the heart. And so heart, when people's heart is defiled, it goes right down and begins to shape the way they view life and shape the way they do life. It's carried into every relationship. It becomes defiled. Now, a, a great example of this. I'll give you some steps out of it in the moment, but let me give you a great example of this. And it's found in, in uh, 1 Samuel chapter 6, and it's the story of David and Michael. And this is a, just a great story because David and Michael, they, they were in love with one another, and they had a destiny of serving together. He was to be the king of Israel. So they have a destiny of God. But before they come into their destiny, there's a journey of preparation. And that journey of preparation so often involves injustice and difficulties and, and some pain. And so both of them go through injustice. Both of them go through being treated unfairly by Saul, which is Michael's father. So she, he, 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 he comes against David to kill him. Everyone who's a friend of David's, he kills him. He hunts him down in the, in, the city, in the nation. And in the end, he has to escape for his life. So he goes from being a hero and a man of honor. He goes to being a criminal, kill on sight, and kill his friends as well. For his wife, his wife, the Bible says she loved him. Now, she's a newlywed in love with her husband. And her father abuses her. He forces her to commit adultery and marry a man she doesn't love and to live with another man. She is severely wounded in her heart by this. So both of them have suffered injustice at the hands of the same man. And each one can make a choice, and the choice will, will, will result in whether they enter their destiny or not. Remember, honor that it may go well for you. There's a promise that God will undertake if we respond to authority figures in our life, especially when they've done acted unjustly. And so what happens is Michael becomes very bitter in her heart. She harbors bitterness in her heart, and that bitterness towards her father then becomes bitterness towards her husband and all men. David faced with the same issue, turns into God, cries out to God, comes to a place of forgiving, chooses to honor Saul. And so God, to test his heart, gives him two opportunities to kill him. And everyone else says, now this is your chance. Get the guy, get the guy. Come on, kill him, cut him down. God has done this. You know, it's like it's got sort of a spiritual religious thing on it. Then God delivered him in his hand. Nail him, get him. You know, and he says, no, so he's got a heart of honor. And he gets the test twice and twice he passes it. And God then raises him up to be king. But on the very day, he's celebrating and bringing the ark back into the city and celebrating and rejoicing and wanting to bless the people and bless his family. It says his wife looked through the window. In other words, she's a spectator to the move of God, not a participator. Why bitterness in her heart? Dishonor of her father, dishonor now of her husband and of God himself. Can you see that when we have an issue that goes right back to our parents, it comes out into every arena of our life, our relationship with God. People can't call him father because the word father's got too much painful emotion. It needs to be resolved, needs to be healed, needs to be sorted out. And so the Bible says she looked through the window and when the husband came in, she gave him the, just the most bitter, cynical thing. Oh, who are you dancing out there in front of you? Th no king would behave like that. And David just pushed back on it. And the Bible says, therefore, she remained barren. Barren spiritually, barren marriage, barren in her womb, barren in her life, no legacy, nothing. Now, the, the, the story is not just written there just for a story or history. It's there to illustrate this principle that when bitterness gets in our heart and we dishonor our parents, there will come consequences we never expected. And this one was in tragic for her. And I, I could share so many stories of people who mean the same thing. It's all how you respond. You just have to choose to move. Move out of that place where, yes, there's a hurt, so I'm going to address it and bring an end to this and build something different. 
And that's the decision. That's the choice we have. First step, of course, is to recognize it. If you've suffered or there's been pain or injustice, if there's dishonor of your parent, there's a wall there, there's a reaction there, there's something going there. Now, there may well be very good reason for that. And I know some situations are so abusive that boundaries have to be built. I'm not talking about that. They do have to be built. I've advised some people to build boundaries because the parents are violent or, or, or destructive. They destroy everything they touch. I said, you have to boundary them so that's not able to invade. You're building something different. However, this is a heart issue. You can boundary a person without having dishonor in your heart and anger and bitterness. You've got to deal with that first of all. And so many situations we've had to boundary. Some have even had to report to the police. And of course, then everyone says, oh, you dishonored your parents, all that kind of thing. No, no. Actually, there was a need to call to account the severe injustice of sexual abuse. This is not a dishonor. This is actually honoring the victim and saying this was something serious that needed to be sorted out, a call for justice. Okay? It's, a, it's balancing it up. And sadly, the culture that we were dealing with, their culture of uh, their honor, shame culture, they then blamed the person who stood up in the side of the victim. So that was very sad. I said, well, you're a man of honor. You stood up for in, against injustice, and the people who agreed to cover it are the villains in the story. They've agreed with the sin. So for the first, though, we need to look. Is this something I'm harboring in my heart related to my father, related to my mother, that is now having an effect in my life? We need to acknowledge the presence of dishonor and underneath the pain and offense. Do you have trouble calling God Father? That would be one of the first things. Think about that. We need to actually own our part in this. Now, the difficulty I found is that when people are deeply wounded, their focus is so much on blaming everyone else, they can't see that actually the problem is over. It's not happening anymore. It's what's going on in their heart is the problem. And God says very clearly, you need to get rid of the dishonor and get rid of the bitterness. There needs to be grace come into your heart. You know, we're not victims. We're called, we're called to bear the image of God. I had one man, and I couldn't get over why we could never solve this conflict that was going on in the marriage and, and, and whatever. And as I discovered, I realized, oh, you've got a victim identity. I'm the hurt one. I'm the one who's treated badly as my identity. Therefore, they wouldn't deal with the pain and bitterness and anger in their heart. And so in the end, I had to rebuke him openly that I said, God, God is not a victim. God has made us in his image. Therefore, to be an image bearer of God, I must abandon victim identity and choose my new identity in Christ. I said, you are in rebellion against God by holding on to this offense and bitterness. You are dishonoring him, and you are creating a problem in your marriage and family for your children. You need to resolve this, and it starts by recognizing, owning it, and repenting. Well, that's what, you've got to talk straight. I mean, you won't help if you dolly it all up. You, you just See, I'm very firmly one that if you violate spiritual principles, there are consequences, but the cross can bring an end to stuff. So the first place I bring people is they've got to see it and own it and stop blaming and then come to a place of repenting. Repentance is the key to, to breaking the hold of these things around our life. And, and often people need to actually have the period where they, they face the grief. I'll talk to you about that and probably how to do that in another time. But, but often there's a deep grief that people have carried. I say, well, go and grieve. You need to actually journal and grieve and actually face the pain and then ask the Lord to remove the pain and you choose to forgive and release. I said, if you've made vows in your heart that you'll, you'll harden your heart and, and protect yourself, you've got to renounce those vows. So whatever we've done to try and save ourselves, we need to bring that to the cross. There's actually a need to do that. You need to let it all go to the cross and, and exchange that pain, that bitterness, that hate, whatever it is, and let the Lord come in and bring healing and restoration, bring deliverance. Bring an end. Sometimes I found people have had to recognize this is a family problem. It was in my father. He was abused. It's in my grandfather. And it's been in generations. So, well, you're the fortunate one that God has come to you and said, you're the one I've chosen to bring it to an end. Step up and don't just deal with the issue in the heart. Create a new legacy in your family. Teach honor in the family. Train the family in the ways of honor. And in your own heart and wherever practical, honor the father and honor the mother. 
You know, what if they're dead? It's still a heart issue. You can talk about and remember the things that were good because there's always some good. Yeah, you'll get, I know this is touchy stuff, all of this stuff here, but but these are the things that we do. Sometimes we've got to renounce and, and stand against the generational curses. I looked in our family and I realized there were generations of adultery and broken relationships on both sides of my family. My parents, as far as I'm aware, that never happened to them. They tried their best to build a great marriage and go through the war and all the difficulties that were with that. However, there was this legacy that was in the family. And God chose me to step up and bring an end to it and to stop that. But I had been affected by it. And I made bad decisions. But at the end, God came, and we've been able to build some, something quite different for the future. See? So, so, so I found that one of the keys for me was to recognize I had made a judgment against my father, repent of it, and then forgive him, and then start to bless him. Every day, just bless him and find ways to honor him. And as I did that, I could feel the change in my heart and the change in our relationship. It was, it was quite different. Quite different. We can do this. Eh? We can do this. See? And so this is what you could do. You can start to move out of that place where you're looking back and there's pain and regret. You don't want to talk about it. You've shut your heart up. And you can see there's some things happening that shouldn't be happening. And you can't work out why. You come humbly before the Lord and say, God, I want to resolve this thing with my father. I want to resolve this thing with my mother. I want to actually face the pain, bring it to the surface, re- let you have the grief and sorrow and repent of my part in the bitterness and dishonoring. And I want to choose to step up and do what you say and enter in and experience your blessing. You say amen to that? Yes. Amen to that. Well, I, I, we run out of time. We've got lots of stories about this kind of stuff uh, of people. That, it, it was quite dramatic, the change that took place. I'll give you one last story. I had one guy came to me and he said to me, yeah, well, you've got to hear the stories because they, they're really good. This is one young guy. He came and said, Pastor, I want to talk to you. And I said, okay, what's the trouble? He said, oh, my, uh, my cell leader doesn't like me. He's against me. I said, really? I find that a bit hard to believe, but okay, come and tell me about it. So he told me this story of the cell leaders against him. I said, all right, why don't you bring this? I tell you what, we'll arrange a meeting with, with the cell meter and you, and you can come and tell me the whole story. So we brought them in. I told the cell leader, now don't say anything. Just don't say a word. Don't defend yourself. Don't say, I just want to hear what he's got to say. And so he came and he, he, he had his piece to say and told me about this and this and this. And I said, oh, wow, wow, okay. And I said, well, look, I'll tell you what. I said, uh, uh, how are you getting on with your boss at work? And he said, oh, I've just started a new job. I said, what, what, why, what happened? He said, oh, well, I quit the other job. And I said, why is that? He said, oh, well, the boss didn't like me and he treated me badly. I said, okay, okay, well, what about the job before that? He said, oh, well, he said, oh, well, I left that. I quit that one too, you know. And, uh, and he said, the boss treated me badly. I said, would you ever have a good job you really like? He said, in the army. Yeah, I, was, I just loved it in the army. You're going to talk about the army. So I let him talk for a bit. You could see him lighting up and he really loved the army. I said, why'd you leave the I said, how'd you get on with the officers? Oh, I didn't like them. They, they, they didn't like me, and they, they, they treated me badly, so that's why I left the army. I said, oh, man, wow, this, this is a really tough story for you. And I said, what about at school? I know, I left early. Didn't get on with the teachers. They didn't teach us, didn't like me. I said, oh, wow, okay, okay. How'd you get on with your dad? Oh, well, he kicked me out of home, and he wasn't really my dad. And uh, it sounds like he didn't like you and, and treated you badly too. He said, yeah, he did. And I said, Wow. I said, okay. I said, well, he said, oh, my, uh, but that's not my real dad. He's my adoptive dad. I said, oh, I see what's going on here. I said, you have unresolved bitterness and anger and rejection in your heart because your parents abandoned you. And you've let it grow as a bitter root in your heart and you've judged them as hating you. That's why they got rid of you. You don't know why they did this. You don't know what was going on in their life. But you've now carried this And now it's colored the way you view the people who actually welcomed you and tried their very best to provide a life for you. And then this attitude against authority figures has flowed through every relationship in your life. I said, you'll either face this and repent of it and let it go, or you're going to have troubles for the rest of your life. Because God's word says, honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise that it may go well for you and you may live long. He did not recognize it. It was so, it's like, hello, the bells are ringing. The pattern's clear. I mean, you can see it. We can see it for him. Maybe you can't see it for yourself. (laughs) 
There's a problem right there, isn't it? You can see it clearly when I lay it out like that. I mean, I had to, and I've, I've laid the story so you can see what was there. He didn't, he didn't see it and he didn't respond. And he's had many problems in his life ever since. Many, including massive accidents. Now, you know, I'm not putting any blame on him. I'm just saying that it seems like God's word is true. <laughs> what it seems to be, that when we honor our father and mother, we position ourselves for the promise of God that life may go well for us. And that means our relationships with people over us who could help us and give us favor is much different. It means our relationship and our marriage is much different. Because I found when people are angry against the dad, they'll say, I'll never be like my dad. Hello, you sound just like him when you get wound up. Or if there are problems with their mother, I'll never marry anyone like my mother. You can't believe how many people have told me that story and their wife is just like their mother. <laughs> you see, these are because that bitter judgments attract the very thing we've judged. We can't violate God's law without consequences, but when we discover them, oh, we can come to him. The lawgiver and the law fulfiller, we can come to Christ and be set free. And I'd like to invite people tonight to actually, just for a moment, just want you to close your eyes, just for a moment. Holy Spirit, we welcome you. Perhaps the worship team can come up again. And Holy Spirit, we just welcome you. Awaken our heart to recognize where there's deep wounds we've never addressed, where in our heart there's dishonor towards our Father. Even the word Father causes a reaction. There's a blockage to knowing our Father in heaven because of a reaction to an earthly father. Perhaps it's towards your mother. Perhaps there's been issues that you've never gotten over. You've just buried them and tried to carry on. You say, God, I can feel the grief coming up right now. The grief of being rejected. Grief of being abused. The grief of being neglected. My situation, I didn't have any of that, but my father had suffered. His father committed adultery, and his father broke up the family. It was done in a public way that was brought humiliation. And he went to war just after he was married devastated after four years and four and a half years on the front line came back shattered emotionally he did the very best he could to build a good family but there was a lack of emotional connection and I felt that very deeply I remember the Lord saying to me you need to forgive and let go and he showed me a picture of a man with a broken leg he said you know he can't run don't you he said, yes, he can't run. He's got a broken leg. He said, that's right. You have to realize that sometimes people are more broken than we realize. And we don't really see what's going on in their life. You need to just accept him as he is. And honor him and thank him and appreciate him. You're the one who needs to change. Because you're becoming like him. And I want you to be like me. Perhaps some of you today, there are areas where there's deep pain. I had to go through this process more than once, not only from a natural father. I had to go through with two spiritual fathers as well who committed adultery. And I was left devastated. But I processed it the same way. Thank God for the good in them and honored it. And then processed my pain at their brokenness and how it affected me. And just forgave and released and blessed them and thank God for them. When one died, I was able to speak at his funeral. I would let go all of the pain, all the disappointment, all the difficulties. You say, I want to honor someone who impacted my life. I focused on what they had, which was their good legacy to me, instead of focusing on their brokenness. If you want to build a great legacy, you do need to resolve any issues related to a father, a mother, or spiritual person, spiritual leader who has caused grief and pain and devastation to you because it blocks you moving forward in favor with God and men. Choose to forgive and honor. Honor the good, forgive the brokenness, and its effect on you.
I think there's many people here who can feel the Holy Ghost sitting on your life. I want you to just deal with this thing. Recognize it. Stop blaming. Say, God, there's a pain in my life. There's bitterness. There's something affecting me. I want to get free of it. I choose to forgive. I choose to let it go. I choose to come to the cross. This is so foundational to our life. I, it's just such a powerful thing. Wherever you are, that's God speaking to you right now. Why don't you raise your hand? God is speaking to me. I need to let go of some things in my life. Just raise your hand right now, wherever you are. God bless. Hands going up everywhere. For some, it may be a church experience. They can be more devastating than anything. Terrible things they can be. Because we expected it would be different. God wants to help us tonight. I just sense a deep healing work going to take place. And God will set you free of things. Generational things, personal things. And you don't no idea what baggage you've carried as a result of this being in your heart since the beginning. Why don't we just all stand together and everyone who wants to just make a response tonight to what I've been sharing. If you'd like to come, make your way to the front. We're going to, is, I can feel God's presence here now. So it's not a yelling time. It's a, it's a very tender time. Just come. Please come. Come. Just come. Come. We want to help you with this journey. We want to help you be free. We want to help you. Just come. Please come. Come. Just Open your heart to the Lord. Close your eyes. Open your heart. Just let whatever's there come to the surface. Let the Spirit of God help you. Holy Spirit, we invite you to come. Come, come, come. There'll be a number of broken families, a number of people, and you're suffering. It was a father. It was a mother. And I've come across some horrendous stories that have affected people's lives for 40 years, 50 years. And in a moment, God set them free. Then they could begin to change the pattern begin to live and build a different legacy. Come, come. Is there anyone else? Just come. Come. I want you to have your eyes closed. This is primarily about engaging with God. And then we'll come and lay hands on you and minister. We have a ministry team if you're available and not in the altar call. Make your way up to the front. Help us with this. I want you just to stay there worshiping for a moment. No one's going to pray for you just yet. Close your eyes. We're going to do this in several steps. Each step's important. So just listen to the steps because they're the steps to your freedom. As you stand there, just allow yourself to feel what it is. You don't have to control it anymore. Father, in Jesus' name, I just bind every controlling spirit that's enabled people to control pain, to bury pain, to hide their trauma, to bury the things that happened to them with their father, with their mother, with spiritual leaders. I just bind and forbid you now from stopping and obstructing anything the Holy Spirit wants to do. Lord, I release that anointing to touch hearts right now to uncover the pain, to uncover what's happened, to uncover bitterness, to uncover anger and hatred and judgments, whatever's there, even suicide, agreements with the spirit of death. Come Holy Spirit. Now I want to stand in the place of fathers who have failed. I want to stand as their representative. I want to stand as a man and as a father and acknowledge the sin against you that broke your heart and hurt you. And I bring that sin to the light and to the cross. You may never hear a natural father say this, but I want to stand as a representative and say it. I'm so sorry that I hurt you so deeply and broke your heart and damaged your life and failed to reveal Father in heaven as being a loving Father. Just right now, while you're starting to be aware then of what's there, I want you just to choose to speak to our Heavenly Father and release words of forgiveness to your earthly father and mother. Just do it now. Just release forgiveness. 
speak it out. Lord, I'm hurting. Take the pain out of my heart. I choose to forgive. I choose to bless. I choose to forgive. I let go in Jesus' name. Any judgments I've made against my father, I want to cancel it now. I cancel all judgments that men will behave this way to me. Cancel all judgments I've made against my mother that women will behave this way. Lord, I want to be free. And here's what we'll do next. You just prepare your heart and the Spirit of God will come on you. I can sense some touching people right now. I will lead you in a prayer. At the end of the prayer, I want you just to worship the Lord. We're going to release His power to come upon you and set you free. Expect to encounter Him. The Bible says, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. The first part is our alignment with the heaven, with God, with his kingdom. I'll lead you in a prayer. I just want you to pray this prayer. Follow me in this prayer. Father in heaven, I come to you in Jesus' name. I declare Jesus Christ is my Savior and Lord. And I'm redeemed by the blood of Jesus from every curse and all demonic oppression. I'm a child of the living God and I am deeply loved. Father, I open my heart to You. I confess to You grief, disappointment, bitterness, Lord, I ask you, forgive me. And I choose now to forgive my father, to forgive my mother. I forgive, I release them now in Jesus' name. I renounce and cancel every judgment I have made against my father, against men, against my mother against woman. I cancel those judgments now. Now, Lord, I stand as a member of my family and I bring to the cross every generational curse that has come down my family line through my father, through my mother. I cut it off in Jesus' Name. I hold the blood of Jesus between me and that curse and I claim freedom in Jesus' Name. I choose honour in Jesus' Name. And today, Lord, I ask You set me free. Heal my broken heart in Jesus' Name. Thank You, Lord. Let's begin to pray in the Spirit. Father, in the Name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I take authority over and I come against all generational curses. I come against occult curses. I come against control curses, curses of witchcraft. I come against Jezebelic spirits. I come against curses of abuse. I come against curses of violence and destruction. In the Name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I break those curses over people's life. I command spirits behind those curses. I command you to go. Curses of abandonment, rejection, curses of dishonour and shame. I command you to go in Jesus' Name. I break these generational curses. Father, I ask now for Your Spirit to come. Come, Lord, and pour out upon people in Jesus' mighty Name. I come against spirits of rejection, abandonment, shame, dishonour, abuse, unclean spirits. Go in Jesus' Name. Come on, let's just worship the Lord together. We have our ministry team. If there's anyone left standing, come around and help me with the prayer now. Thank you, Lord. Touch, touch. Holy Spirit, come, touch. It's all right, dear. Let it go now. Let it go. Let it go. Let it go. Spirit of grief. Release her, release her, release her. 
releasing out. Touch the spirit of grief, grief, abandonment, abandonment. I command you release her now. Let it go. Go in Jesus' name. I come against witchcraft. Loose her now. Let it go. Loose her now.
Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hey, if you have not received prayer, just lift up your hand at the stage so that the people praying can identify you if you're still waiting for someone to pray for you. Just lift your hand up nice and high. That'd be great. It looks like pretty much everybody's been prayed for. Awesome. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. You're doing a great work in the house, in your family over these few days. We thank you for what you've done tonight. Thank you, Lord, for touching us in the deepest parts of our heart. And we thank you, you're a father who loves your family. Father, I ask that you would release just that spirit of love, the Father's love right now, right across every person. You know, one of the things that really helped me encounter that love was meditating on the scripture of the prodigal son. Jesus said, this is, I've come to show what the father's like. Here's what he's like. And the young son, who was covered in the pig filth and smell, arose and went to his father. This is what it says in verse 20 of Luke 15. His father saw him when he was a long way off because he was always longing for that child. And when he saw his son, his daughter, you, he was moved with compassion. His heart was moved with a deep desire to connect and help. There's no judgment. He had already forgiven. He just wanted the relationship. And he did what no father would do. He ran to his son. And when he got to him, he hugged him, kissed him. That's our heavenly father. When he sees us looking towards him, he is moved with compassion. He saw what you went through. He saw the times you've cried alone. There was no one to comfort. Times when you felt there was no hope. He saw what you've carried all these years. And he moved quickly to you. Well, right now we release that anointing, the love of God, into the house. One, two, three. Come, Holy Spirit. God's touching hearts very deeply. He loves you deeply. Believes in you. Has a destiny for you. Let him have the pain. Let him have the grief. Let him have the heartache. Let him just love you. Nothing can separate us from that love. Father, Father, I'm home. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for believing in me. 
thank you for continually reaching out to me. Thank you for sending people to help me. Thank you, Father, for a church, a house like this, where I can find you, feel your presence. Father, thank you. Just enjoy his presence. Enjoy him. He loves us to just enjoy him. I take that passage, that verse, and meditate on it. I see me in it. Coming to the Father. Thank you, Father. I purposed as God loved me and gave me grace to overcome the experiences I'd walked through. That I would build a legacy to honor Him. I have seven children. One we adopted has been restored into her place. She serves in our church. 25 grandchildren. All the families are in the house of God serving. It's a miracle. They love us. They want to be with us. I couldn't ask for anything more. I just thank Father that he helped us. We had to fight in prayer for every one of our children. But they all love us. Honor us. And are building Godly families. God has chosen you. It's never too late. He's chosen you to bring an end to patterns of things in your family and to build something better for the next generation. Oh, I'd made many mistakes. I had to go and apologize and put them right. I even went to my son recently and apologized, asked his forgiveness. Because I realized my sin before we were married had consequences that affected him for so many years. I said, son, I'm so sorry. I see that what I did has affected your life. And I put it right with him. This is how we do things in the family of God. We put things right. And it may be that God speaks to you about things that need to be put right. Do it simply, humbly, without explanation. I'm so sorry I hurt you. I've had to do this with my wife, with my son. The daughter we adopted out, I'm sorry. Please forgive me for the pain that my failure has caused. And God gave grace. I don't know what he would do in your situation, but I do know what he did say. Honor your father and mother which is the first commandment with promise that it may go well for you and you may live long. Father, I pray blessing on every family here, healing of broken hearts. What you started tonight will continue into families, even into the churches represented here. 
this will be a key marker for ministry. Honor. Honor. Honor for natural fathers and mothers. Honor for spiritual fathers and mothers. Honor for God. Amen. God bless you. Awesome. Well, we were really praying that God would come and minister to us as a church, as a people over these days. That's what we really desired, that God would make us whole. Um, you know, it wasn't a training seminar. It was God come and make us whole. Because um, when God makes us whole, we can minister out of wholeness. wholeness. And when the broken areas of our life get restored and put back together, then we don't replicate the brokenness and uh, we can help to, to bring restoration. But, you know, the interesting thing is, too, that every one of us, um, the journey is all, all the same. You know, we all come to the same God. <laughs> we all have to come to repentance. Uh, we all have to deal with our past and this, the generational sin as well as our own sin. We all have to do that through repentance. Um, it's, it's all the same. I, I, when... Um, Brother Mike was sharing, I can remember when I became a Christian, first became a Christian, one of the things God spoke to me about was all of the curses and everything over my family line. No Christians, broken marriages, all kinds of rubbish, all the way back to the family line. I remember saying over again, it stops here. It just stops here. The curses, the, it stops here. And just what Mike was saying, a new life begins. But I love the way that when you hear people ministering, you, you, you're on the same path. You know, there's no different way <laughs> it's the same way it's the same path uh, the, you know the same journey that we come to in God it's very very encouraging isn't it I mean just uh, feel so encouraged so blessed in the Lord but also just want to thank you guys for being open you know what a what a privilege it is to be with a group of people that love God that are prepared to open up their hearts to God prepared to ask for forgiveness prepared to allow God to deliver them and set them free and set us free, you know, as a family. What a, what a blessing. But in, in closing uh, tonight, I want us to sing that uh, song about the Holy Spirit. And, uh, you know, in these times, that's, that's, this is a work of the Holy Spirit. This is the Holy Spirit coming down inside of our lives and changing us forevermore, changing us forevermore. It's powerful. It's awesome. And so when we, when we sing this song about the Holy Spirit tonight in closing, um, let's let's just magnify him with this song. Let's anoint him as if we could, you know, with our with our worship, with our praise. As we're singing, we're thanking him, we're adoring him, appreciating him, and uh, you could even put in a little bit of appreciation for our brother Mike. Just loved his honesty, his openness, his journey. Isn't it awesome? Yeah, give him a blessing, church, because it's it's awesome stuff. We really appreciate that. All right, thanks, team.
Maria na no maha. Tackling people, <laughs> putting on some big hits. <laughs> hey, uh, greet one another with a handshake and a hug and a blessing, and let the love of God just flow one from another. And you know, this is your family. This is family. It's, it's, this is uh, you're going to spend a lot of time with these people, eternity. Uh, the cafe is open. There's nice hot coffee out there. There's some. American hot dogs and all sorts of foody food things. And stick around, have a bit of fellowship, have a bit of food, have a bit of fun together. That'll be fantastic. God bless you.